Welcome to Danish Academy, an online learning community and your gateway to fast and easy education. Today we're diving into the world of biosignals with a focus on EMG. Let's explore the fascinating world of biosignals together. We'll start by learning about fundamental concepts like biosignals, bioelectric potentials, electrodes and neurons. Then we'll dive into EMG in detail. Finally, we'll explore how EMG data is processed and its real-world applications, providing engineering students with a special insight into this exciting field. Now, what are these biosignals? Biosignals or biological signals encompass space, time or space-time data capturing a biological phenomena like heartbeats or muscle contractions. These signals stemming from electrical, chemical, and mechanical activities offer measurable insights ripe for analysis. Some examples of famous biosignals which you may be familiar with are electroneurogram, abbreviated as ENG, which are signals obtained from a nerve, electrocardiogram or ECG, which are signals obtained from a heart, electromyogram or EMG, which are signals obtained from a muscle, and finally, electroencephalogram or EEG which are signals obtained from a brain. Bioelectric potentials are produced as a result of electrochemical activity of a certain class of cells known as excitable cells that are components of nervous, muscular or glandular tissue acting like tiny batteries. These excitable cells normally have a resting charge referred to as resting potential but stimulate them right and they'll fire off an action potential, an electrical spark. This electrochemical activity is what creates those bioelectric potentials which scientists study. Crazy that our cells can generate their own currents and voltages. Now that we know what are these bioelectric potentials, let's talk about resting potential and action potential in detail. The individual cell keeps a steady electrical difference between its internal environment and external environment, called the resting potential. This usually sits in the range of negative 40 to negative 90 millivolts compared to the environment around it. Now, let's take a look at action potentials. When appropriately stimulated, excitable cells such as neurons and muscle cells exhibit an electrical signal known as an action potential. This phenomenon can be visualized in the figure to the left. An action potential has two distinct phases. Increasing phase, which is the initial part of the action potential, where the cell's membrane potential rapidly increases, reaching a peak. Then decreasing phase. The subsequent part of the action potential where the membrane potential rapidly decreases, returning to its resting state. After an action potential is generated, the cell enters a refractory period. During this time, the cell cannot be easily stimulated to produce another action potential. This refractory period has two important aspects. First, absolute refractory period, which is a brief period immediately following the action potential, where the cell is completely unresponsive to any additional stimulation, and then the relative refractory period, a longer period where the cell is less responsive to stimulation but can still be excited under stronger or more prolonged stimuli. The refractory period is a crucial mechanism that prevents the cell from firing action potentials too rapidly allowing it to properly recover and maintain its signaling capabilities. The electrical conduction in the human body occurs through the movement of ions, which means that the electrical currents in the human body are electrolytic currents. This is in contrast to the conduction currents used in electronic devices like computers, which display biosignals obtained from patients. To bridge the gap between the electrolytic currents in the body and the conduction currents used in electronic devices, we need a converter. This converter acts as a bridge, 
allowing the two different types of currents to be seamlessly integrated. Electrodes are the answer to this problem. Electrodes serve as the interface between the electrolytic currents in the body and the conduction currents in the electronic devices. They facilitate the conversion of one type of current to the other, enabling the effective measurement and display of biosignals obtained from patients. Some famous electrode types are skin surface, cup electrode, needle electrode, and finally microelectrodes. Each of these electrodes have their own specific applications and advantages and disadvantages, which can be the topic of another video. Now that you understand how biosignals are obtained, let's delve into the crucial element that transports these signals to the designated area for acquisition. You are probably familiar with neurons from school, but let's talk about different kinds of neurons. Motor neurons are responsible for transmitting messages from the central nervous system to the muscles, enabling movement and physical actions. When the motor neuron is activated, it triggers the contraction of the muscle fibers allowing us to perform a wide range of voluntary movements, from walking and running to grasping and manipulating objects. Sensory neurons, on the other hand, play a crucial role in our ability to perceive and interpret the world around us. These neurons are responsible for transmitting information from sensory receptors, such as those found in the skin, muscles, joints, and internal organs, to the central nervous system. When these receptors are stimulated, the sensory neurons convert the physical or chemical signals into electrical impulses, which are then relayed to the brain for processing and interpretation. This two-way communication between the body and the brain, facilitated by motor and sensory neurons, is essential for our overall bodily function and our ability to interact with the environment. In this part of the video, we will learn about EMG in detail. Firstly, we'll learn about SMU or single motor unit and SMUAP. Then, we will learn about EMG acquisition methods. And finally, two of EMG's clinical applications, which are neuropathy and myopathy. A single motor unit or SMU consists of a single motor neuron and the muscle fibers it innervates typically ranging from 25 to 2,000 fibers. The activation of an SMU is triggered by a motor neuron, which controls the contractions of muscle fibers in the SMU. Essentially, an SMU is the smallest functional unit of a muscle that can be activated by a single neuron. It is important to note that every muscle is made up of numerous single motor units. When a modern neuron transmits an electrical signal which is an action potential to a SMU, the muscle fibers within that SMU are activated. As a result, the SMU generates another action potential. The electrical potential generated by a single motor unit is called the SMUAP. The SMUAP is a composite signal that represents the combined action potentials from all the muscle fibers for instance, seven fibers in our picture within that particular SMU. SMUAPs are brief electrical signals generated by the activation of individual motor units within a muscle. These SMUAPs typically consist of two or three distinct phases, or we can say they are two or three phasic, each lasting a few milliseconds. Relative to the size of the motor unit, SMUAPs have an amplitude range of 0.02 to 2 millivolts. These SMUAPs have a frequency bandwidth ranging from 5 Hz to 10 kHz. Electromyogram or EMG is the collective recording of multiple SMUAPs from a muscle, providing insights into the electrical activity and functions of the muscle. Now that we know 
What EMG is, let's take a look at how it is acquired. There are two primary types of EMG electrodes using electromyography. The first one is needle electrodes or inserted electrodes. This method involves the insertion of electrodes into the muscle tissue. While considered invasive, it typically provides higher quality signals due to its direct contact with the muscle fibers. And the second, surface electrodes. The EMG acquired by this method is called surface EMG or SEMG. These electrodes are placed on the skin surface, making them a non-invasive option. However, they generally offer lower signal quality compared to inserted electrodes. Neuropathy refers to a range of conditions that affect the motor nerves, which are responsible for transmitting signals from the brain and spinal cord to the muscles. Two common examples of neuropathy include, first, reduced nerve conduction speed. In this condition, the speed at which electrical signals travel through the motor nerves is slowed down, leading to impaired muscle function and coordination. And two, asynchronization between muscle fibers. Neuropathy can cause a lack of synchronization between individual muscle fibers, resulting in uncoordinated muscle contractions and reduced strength. In a normal muscle, the EMG shows a regular pattern of electrical activity during muscle contraction. However, in a muscle affected by neuropathy, the EMG pattern changes significantly. The image on the right shows a normal EMG, while the new image depicts the EMG of a denervated muscle, which has been affected by neuropathy. In a denervated muscle, the EMG shows irregular, spontaneous electrical activity even at rest as well as reduced or absent electrical activity during muscle contraction. These EMG changes are important in diagnosing and monitoring the progression of neuropathy, as they provide valuable information about the health and function of the motor nerves and muscles. Myopathy refers to a group of disorders that primarily affect the muscle fibers rather than the nerves that control them. In myopathy, there is a reduction in the number of active muscle fibers within the SMUs, while the nerves are intact. This means that the same amount of muscle strength requires more motor units to be stimulated, resulting in a lower force output per unit. So it can be concluded that, to achieve the same level of muscle strength, more motor units need to be recruited, resulting in a different pattern of muscle activation compared to healthy individuals. In a normal EMG, the EMG recording shows a normal pattern of motor unit activation with clear, well-defined motor unit action potentials. But in a myopathic EMG, the EMG recording will typically show smaller, more numerous motor unit action potentials. This reflects the increased number of motor units required to generate the same amount of muscle force. By understanding the underlying mechanisms and the characteristic EMG findings, healthcare professionals can better diagnose and manage myopathic conditions, ultimately improving patient outcomes. In this section, we will delve into various signal processing techniques applied to EMG data. We start by exploring the diagnosis of muscle fatigue through EMG signal processing, followed by SEMG decomposition. Next, we delve into EMG modeling and conclude with an in-depth look at feature extraction and classification methods for EMG signals. Muscle fatigue is a complex physiological phenomenon that manifests as a decrease in muscle performance due to various factors. When muscle fatigue, there is a notable shift in EMG characteristics. This shift is characterized by a decrease in EMG frequency accompanied by an increase in amplitude leading to a shift towards lower frequencies in the EMG spectrum. Additionally, the speed of stimulation decreases, but more motor units are recruited to compensate for the fatigued muscle fibers. Understanding and diagnosing muscle fatigue is crucial in various fields, including rehabilitation and sports medicine. For example, by accurately assessing and monitoring muscle fatigue, healthcare professionals can tailor rehabilitation programs and training regimens 
to optimize recovery and performance. When EMG is acquired by skin surface electrodes, the raw EMG signal contains a wealth of information that can be further analyzed to gain a more precise understanding of the underlying motor unit action potentials or SMUAPs. One approach to extracting this detailed information is through a process called SEMG decomposition. This involves breaking down the complex EMG signal into its constituent SMUAPs, which represent the electrical activity of individual motor units within the muscle. There are several signal processing methods that can be employed to decompose the EMG signal and extract the SMUAPs. One method is pattern recognition, which involves identifying and classifying the individual SMUAPs based on their unique waveform characteristics. By comparing the shape, amplitude, and duration of the SMUAPs, they can be assigned to a specific motor units. Another method is wavelet detection. Wavelet detection in SEMG decomposition uses wavelet analysis to extract features from EMG data for classification. It involves selecting mother wavelets, decomposing EMG segments into bands, constructing feature vectors, and identifying relevant bands and features to accurately detect specific conditions or states in the EMG signals. Modeling EMG signals hold significant potential in the realm of designing artificial systems. By accurately capturing and analyzing EMG data, researchers and engineers can develop innovative solutions that bridge the gap between human physiology and artificial intelligence. This approach enables the creation of advanced prosthetics, intuitive human-machine interfaces, and cutting-edge robotics that can revolutionize healthcare, rehabilitation, and various industries. Feature extraction and classification of EMG signals play a crucial role in various applications, including the diagnosis of illnesses and the control of rehabilitation systems like bionic arms. By analyzing EMG signals, valuable insights can be gained to aid in the accurate identification of medical conditions and the development of advanced prosthetic technologies. This process involves extracting relevant features from EMG data to characterize muscle activity patterns, and then utilizing classification algorithms to interpret these patterns for diagnostic purposes and to enable precise control of prosthetic devices. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope you found it helpful. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great content coming your way soon. Also, let me know in the comment section below what you thought about today's video and if there are any other topics you'd like me to cover in the future. Until then, see you in the next one.